Thank you, Jennifer, for your kind introduction. And greetings from Santa Barbara, California. I'm really honored and pleased to give this lecture today, named for my longtime mentor and friend, John Prausnitz. The topic I've chosen to speak about is the link between chemical engineering practice and chemical engineering science, and nobody epitomizes that link more than John Prausnitz. For centuries, people have required the products of chemical manufacturing to produce soaps, dyes, chemicals for tanning leather, medicines, clean water, and other products to improve the quality of people's lives. So before I get into the lecture, let's look back at some of the early processes. And I'm showing you one here from the 1550s, which looks very primitive. But if you look more closely at this particular piece of the process, you'll notice three stirred tub reactors. Maybe they call them CSTRs. This is actually a really ingenious process where the original practitioners, even by the 1550s, had already discovered that three tanks in series gave better performance than one tank with three times the volume. These days, we know why. We know that three, three stirred tanks in series is more or less equivalent to one plug flow reactor. And normally, plug flow reactors are the optimal kind of uh, reactor configuration. Over the centuries, <coughs> chemical processes improved. And today, we have processes that look like this. The huge shell pearl GTL plant in Qatar. And this, a big GE plastics polycarbonate plant in Cartagena in Spain. What was the transition that allowed us to go from this to this? You don't wake up one day and suddenly decide, oh, I think I'm going to start building my process in this configuration. And what happened, of course, over the centuries is that chemical engineering science allowed us to do things that were inconceivable 500 years ago. Concepts like conservation of mass and energy, Gibbsian thermodynamics, the fundamentals of kinetics and catalysis, and of course, the huge revolution brought about by digital computers. All of that science is what enabled the transition to modern technology to happen. So let me give you a brief outline of what I want to talk about today. I want to have a little introduction on how the pioneers of our subject were treated. Then I want to talk about three things chemical processes, and how can we tell which the best process is, pharmaceuticals, medicines, and I want to say a few words about the new vision for digital design. I have one slide on water and one slide on teaching and service, and then I'll end the lecture. So let's start by talking about how the pioneers were treated. Not very kindly, as it turns out. George Davis was one of the pioneers of the profession, and he wrote several books in the 1880s. This particular book was reviewed in the august journal Nature in 1880, and the review begins, kindly enough, the application of a certain kind of science to a certain kind of commerce is rapidly producing a literature of its own. That's a pretty good definition of engineering. 
But later in the review, things get substantially worse. <clears throat> it is hardly worthwhile taking up valuable space by noticing the merits or demerits of a book such as this, the object or at least the tendency of which is to show the manufacturer how, by the application of a certain kind of scientific facts and principles, he may seek to perpetuate a system which we honestly think is simply a gigantic fraud. So things couldn't really have got off to a worse start. But 70 or 80 years later, <clears throat> things had improved significantly. And by 1967, Roger Sargent was able to write this pioneering visionary paper with the title Integrated Design and Optimization of Processes. In this paper, Roger laid out a vision for the next 50 to 100 years of work in process systems engineering. And the remarkable thing is that almost everything that Roger predicted has come true. I want to read you the bottom part of this uh, quote from his paper. And if I could be removed from the screen temporarily, no one can pretend that the overall position on mathematical models in current use for design is satisfactory. That's still true. Progress is required in both directions, towards simpler models which give an adequate representation of the early, early stages of design. And nobody did better than Jim Douglas in this domain. And towards more accurate models which reflect the true influence of design variables for use in later stages of design. Fine. The surprising thing is that Roger goes on to say this. The problem is not so much one of numerical techniques, but one of basic understanding of the physical mechanisms involved. Real progress, and here he means real progress in design, can only come from painstaking and detailed experimental and theoretical work over the whole field of chemical engineering. So here he is laying out in this paper a vision for the next 50 to 100 years of process systems engineering. And what does he conclude? The key thing is to develop chemical engineering science. And it's the combination of chemical engineering science, new methods in process systems engineering, and digital computers that allow us to do the things today that could not have been done in former centuries. And so some of the advances that are worth noting since Roger wrote that paper were advances in process simulation, advanced by Roger himself, and of course by Larry Evans with the Aspen Project and many others. None of those simulators would be worth much if, it, if, they, if they didn't have thermodynamic models and physical property models as the foundation stone. And this, of course, nobody Nobody did more for this subject than John Prausnitz. Pinch technology for heat integration, Bodo Linhoff. Separation system synthesis and conceptual design for a whole variety of separation systems, Rakesh Agarwal, <coughs> uh, Clarence Gearhold, who did all the beautiful work on pressure swing adsorption and others. Those very complex processes I showed you couldn't possibly be controlled by simple PID controllers alone. They take modern model predictive control methods pioneered by Jim Rawlings, Manfred Marari, George Stepanopoulos, optimization and algorithmic methods such as mixed integer nonlinear programming, global optimization methods, pioneered by Ignacio Grossman, Larry Beagler, Nick Sahanides, Chris Flutus, and others. But none of these things are what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on a different question. And the question is, what is the absolute best performance that can be achieved by my process? For power and energy systems, we can compute the minimum Gibbs free energy change 
to provide benchmarks. For heat engines, we have the Carnot efficiency that provides a benchmark. These are all thermodynamic benchmarks, and from these benchmarks, we do not get to ask, please tell me, what is exactly the right realistic engine design that delivers this efficiency? The corresponding question in chemical engineering, let's say process engineering, was asked by Fritz Horn in 1964. And the Fritz Horn question is, given a set of reactions and given chemical kinetics, what is the attainable region of all the possible compositions that can be reached by any possible reactor design? Any possible reactor design. This is, this is a kinetic bound, not a thermodynamic bound. And for many years, it was tackled from two quite different points of view. Geometric methods pioneered by David Glasser, Diane Hildebrandt, and Cameron Crowe. And optimization methods, superstructure methods, that were developed by Larry Beagler, Antonis Kokosis, Chris Flutus, and others. But after 15 years of research in both of these areas, we all came to the conclusion that the geometric methods were intractable in high dimensions, and the optimization methods gave no guarantee on the completeness of the superstructure, and therefore could not guarantee that you had actually found the attainable region. And by around 2000, all of us who were working in that field had more or less given up, except for one person. And that person is Martin Feinberg. So the stars of the next section of my lecture are these two gentlemen, Alan Turing and Martin Feinberg. Turing, because without the stored program discrete state machine that he invented in his famous paper of 1936, in which he invented the concept of the digital computer and using mathematical logic proved all of the properties of such a machine. Without that, we would not be able to do any of the things I'm going to talk about today. The heart of what I'm going to talk about is what Martin Feinberg did. But first, <clears throat> let's say, let's reflect back on what Turing did in the early 1950s. After developing his paper on, on Turing machine computers, he then turned his attention to chemical reaction systems, and he wrote this classic paper in 1952, which I believe is the first one ever to use linear stability analysis on a reaction and reaction diffusion system. But the 50s also produced many other outstanding papers in reaction engineering. Peter Dankwert's paper on residence time distributions, the fantastic Ballou and Amundsen paper on chemical reactor stability that spawned thousands of papers like it in the literature, the incredible papers by Haugen and Watson and their books, Aris, his many papers and books. But for process systems engineering, the paper that really stands out to me is the paper by Feinberg and Ellison. And in this paper, they develop a completely general, rigorously correct kinetic theory of kinetic bounds on the productivity and selectivity in arbitrary reactor separator systems. And this is exactly what's needed to advance process systems engineering. So what was, what did they prove in that paper? They proved that any arbitrary process, which is to say any process you can think of, and all the processes we cannot think of, all of them can be represented by a very simple decomposition. And that decomposition we call the Feinberg decomposition, and it consists of R plus one stirred tank reactors, not in series, but each one is connected to a perfect separation system, or if you like, a split block that takes in 
the feed to the system and all of the exit streams from the reactors and performs splits <clears throat> according to the optimization that you're about to carry out that respects all of the material and energy balances in the system. The number of reactors R plus 1 is typically a small number. R is the number of linearly independent chemical reactions. And even in complex react reaction systems, this number is typically a small integer like 4 or 10 or 15. But it's a completely manageable optimization to carry out. They prove that the Feinberg decomposition cannot be outperformed and so that generating selectivity bounds, the ultimate possible selectivity bounds for your given kinetics over all possible process configurations becomes an optimization problem on this Feinberg decomposition. It's a most remarkable theorem and incredibly useful in process systems engineering, as I'll show you now through a simple example. So let's consider two reactions. So R is equal to 2. The first reaction is the main reaction. Ethanol is reacted to form ethyl acetate and hydrogen. But this catalytic reaction also <clears throat> produces diethyl ether and water as side products. And I'd <clears throat> like to acknowledge my joint student, Vikram Khanna, who developed a kinetic model for this chemistry. He also plotted the selectivity versus the conversion for that model. And what we see is the selectivity is fairly good, 90% until about 30% conversion. And then it drops off precipitously. There are several commercial processes that practice this chemistry, and all of them operate at 30% reactor conversion, and you can see why. So maybe we should try and improve our uh, conceptual design of the reactor system and let, let's look at the chemistry and see if we can invent a better process. So one thing we might consider is having multiple pack beds in series with, with separators in between to remove the hydrogen. This relieves the first reaction away from equilibrium. It speeds up the first reaction relative to the second reaction and therefore you would expect it would improve the selectivity of the chemistry. And indeed it does. I'd like to acknowledge my former student, Jeff Frumpkin, who did these calculations. And so here we have four pack beds in series, three separators to remove the hydrogen in between. And indeed, if you look at the selectivity versus conversion plot for this re reactor configuration, it is indeed better. But still, <clears throat> The, after about 30 or 35 percent reactor conversion, the selectivity tails off. We might think of a better embodiment of this process configuration than what I wrote down here, or what I depict here. We might think, for instance, of reactive distillation, where the catalyst is on each of the trays of the column, and hydrogen naturally moves up the column, the products move down the column, and indeed, one of the commercial processes is a reactive distillation process. But unfortunately, the selectivity versus conversion plot for a reactive distillation is hardly better than the one I'm showing you here. And so you might speculate, perhaps reactive distillation is as good as it gets. And if you'd asked me this question back in the 1980s or the 1990s when I was writing papers with Mike Malone and our joint students on reactive distillation, we may very well have agreed with that. But in fact, if we go through and calculate the Feinberg selectivity limit, what you discover is that the selectivity of this chemistry can in fact go to close to 100%. So the current industrial embodiments of the technology are leaving a great deal of selectivity and a great deal of conversion on the table. It only requires three CSTRs in the Feinberg decomposition to discover this. So this is a really straightforward problem. But you might say, well, perhaps in order to get such good performance, 
the Feinberg decomposition requires too much catalyst. So Jeff Frumpkin actually did that calculation too. And what do we find? Not only does the Feinberg decomposition give better selectivity and better conversion, it also requires less catalyst. So the conclusion from this simple example is that the current technology leaves a lot to be desired. And the conclusion from this section of my lecture is that if you calculate the Feinberg selectivity and it's low, you should work on catalysis and kinetics. If you calculate the Feinberg selectivity and it's high, but your process is not giving you a very high selectivity, you should be more creative and work on a better process design. In other words, the benchmark provided by the Feinberg selectivity limit provides an incentive for which problem to work on and how much is left on the table. This is an incredibly fertile area for future research, in my opinion, and already we're starting to see the Feinberg decomposition coupled with more traditional process synthesis methods, such as the recent paper by Tian and Stratos Pistacopoulos, in which they calculate the, the attainable region envelope using the Feinberg decomposition for the particular chemistry and reactor separator system that they study in this paper. And then they locate the various conceptual designs created by traditional process synthesis methods within that attainable region, knowing that it's not possible to have any real process that lies outside that region. So this is in my opinion, a really fertile area for future research. Now let's turn our attention to medicines. Back in the Middle Ages, there were alchemists who were making lotions and potions and medicines and poisons and all kinds of things that were needed by the population. And this is a typical alchemical laboratory this is an image of a modern continuous process plant for producing small molecule pharmaceuticals. Happens to be an Eli Lilly plant, but similar plants can be found at other major name brand uh, pharmaceutical companies. So <clears throat> this is the way it's being carried out today. This is the leading edge kind of technology. And again, requires all of the things that I was talking about earlier. But there's a new vision for these kinds of, of products, and it's called Digital Design of Drug Product and Processes. And the idea is that the chemists and the chemical engineers pick up with a molecular structure, handed over to us by the medicinal chemists, who believe that this, there's some therapeutic value to such a molecule. It's gone through the various phases of trials, and it's now up to us to develop the product and the process to make this uh, available to the public in tablet or capsule form. And so the, f the workflow for this digital design goes something like this. The first thing you need to know is the crystal structure. All of these drugs are going to be formulated as crystals because their molecular weights are too high for them to be, to be boiled or distilled. And so they're formulated as, as, as crystal products typically. And so the first step is to design the crystal. What crystal structures are possible and how can we predict what they are? And there's teams around the world, a notable team in London doing this is the Sally Price team and her colleagues at UCL and uh, the team at Imperial College led by Claire Adjaman um, and her colleagues there. The <clears throat> The next thing, once you know the crystal structure, is to be able to make some predictions about the, morpho the crystal morphology. And there are now established methods for doing this to be able to predict what the various faces on the crystal are likely to be and what the shape of the crystal is likely to be. Then we need to know something about solvent. So solubility is important. Crystal growth and nucleation are important. And once all of these 
topics are understood and, and predicted and calculated, they can be put into process models to find the attainable region of particle sizes. So this is a picture of the mean particle size that you might get out of a particular kind of crystallizer as a function of the residence time of the solution in the crystallizer, showing the largest mean particle size and the smallest mean particle size for any given particular design. And finally, if I could be removed, thank you, the final step would be then to predict how am I going to get the desired polymorph from my process? These drugs typically uh, occur in many different crystal structures. So this is glutamic acid, L-glutamic acid, in two of its crystal structures that turn out to give different polymorphs, different crystal shapes. Typically, one of these is registered with the FDA, and we need to make sure that we not only get the right particle size, we also get the right polymorph that our, our process is producing. So let me briefly go through two or three of those steps. The growth models that we all use today were pioneered by Charles Frank in uh, around 1950, 49, 50, 51, were the classic papers he and his colleagues wrote on this subject. Since then, Alex Chernoff has Nobody has done more for the general theory of crystal growth after Charles Frank than Alex Chernoff, who has written a series of classic papers and books on the topic. And in the world of organic molecular crystals, nobody has done more than Roger Davey. Roger, I think, was the real pioneer back in the 1970s, 80s, 90s of molecular crystallization of organic materials, and he's still publishing pioneering papers to this day. So how does this go? With the known crystal structure, we find for each of the, of the likely crystal faces what the step edges are likely to be flowing across those faces. Once we've determined the step edges, we can determine what the shapes of the spirals are, the growth spirals hypothesized by Charles Frank in his famous 1951 paper. And so we find that the, the growth spirals on each of the crystal faces, knowing the rotation time of those spirals gives us both the absolute growth rate and the relative growth rate of each of the crystal faces. And this is the predicted morphology, it happens to be for naphthalene crystals grown out of ethanol solution. And down below it, you see the experimental morphology there is nothing at all in this predicted morphology that knows anything about the experimental morphology. So this is good enough for engineering work, and although uh, it worked out very well for naphthalene from ethanol, there's still plenty of research to do in this area for more complicated mole molecular systems. Let's talk a little bit about solvent selection, solubility, and crystal growth rate. Solubility is determined from molecular simulations by calculating the chemical potential of the solute, which is constant because the solute is generally a pure solute with essentially no solvent in it. So the solute chemical potential is this horizontal line. The chemical potential of solute in solution, of course, does change because as you change the composition of the solution from undersaturated to supersaturated, you will indeed change the chemical potential of the solute. And where these two curves intersect is the saturation concentration. And this now has been, these kinds of calculations have been performed for a number of systems mentioned here. Uh, this has all been done in the last handful of years. And the pioneers here that I'd like to call out are Carlos Vega at the University of Madrid, Dan Frankel at the University of Cambridge, my old college, Trinity College, Cambridge, and Thanos Panagiotopoulos at Princeton. We can foresee a day where these calculations will produce for us the saturation mole fraction at various different temperatures and where we can make a plot, a Van Hoff plot of the logarithm of the saturation concentration versus versus the reciprocal of the temperature, and that should be a straight line on a Van Hoff plot. 
Here I'm showing a Clausius Clapeyron plot that was recently calculated by my joint student Vikram Khanna. And this shows a plot of the sublimation vapor pressure as a function of the reciprocal temperature for succinic acid using molecular simulation methods. You'll see that the data points, the blue data points on this plot are the results of the molecular simulations. These molecular simulations, of course, know nothing about that they should lie on a straight line on a Van Hoff plot, but indeed they do. And the other data I'm showing on this graph are the experimental data. Again, the, 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 the uh, predicted uh, clausius clapeyron plot is certainly good enough for engineering work. Let me say a few words about crystal growth rate. This is really an open area of research and has been performed only for very, very few systems. Sodium chloride growing out of water is the one I know particularly well. And in order to calculate the crystal growth rates, we need to know what the free energy landscape looks like. Uh, this shows the free energy landscape of chloride ions in solution as a function of two of the key variables on which it depends. And this landscape shows chloride ions in solution at this basin and chloride ions attached to the crystal surface at this basin. And the minimum free energy path that the ions travel as they go from solution to crystal is this path here. It looks like a two-step mechanism. And <clears throat> from this uh, free energy landscape, we can put together a, an appropriate reaction coordinate. We can calculate the free energy barrier. From that, using um, kinetic analysis, we can calculate the attachment and detachment rates of ions into and out of kink sites. And that all gets fitted together in the growth models and in this plot, I'm showing the absolute predicted growth rate in nanometers per second of sodium chloride crystals as a function of the supersaturation of sodium chloride in solution. The solid curve is the prediction by molecular simulation. The points are data points taken, experimental data points taken from the literature, and again, there is nothing in this solid line prediction that knows anything about the experimental data. These calculations were carried out by uh, my joint student, Mark Joswick. Uh, the real uh, brains behind the whole thing was Baron Peters. I'd like to acknowledge both of them. <clears throat> and my final uh, topic of this uh, digital design it leads me back to the Feinberg <clears throat> theory. And now what we're going to think about is what the attainable region of mean particle sizes are. This is a very important metric in pharmaceutical manufacturing because for tableting, the mean particle size is usually very specific, perhaps in the order of 50 microns. And so we'd like to know what any particular crystallizer configuration will give us for the mean particle size. And one way of answering this question is to put together a series of stirred tank crystallizers. When you have many of them, they approximate a plug flow crystallizer, which in turn is equivalent to a batch crystallizer. And if you formulate the attainable region theory, you can plot the mean particle size as a function of the total residence time in that crystallizer cascade. And for different numbers of crystallizers, two, three, four, five, many, you can <clears throat> produce these envelopes. And the envelope shows the maximum and minimum mean particle size that you can attain for any given uh, residence time. So, the way to read this plot, for instance, is if you have two crystallizers in series and a total residence time of six hours, the smallest size crystals you can make are around 200 microns. The largest are around 400 microns. If that's not good enough, then you need to go to three crystallizers or four or many. And in between the maximum and the minimum, all of the mean particle sizes in between are attainable just by having a different process design. 
But in these calculations, it's assumed that all of the crystallizers are well mixed. And that, of course, is not true, especially when you have a particulate solution. And so what are the true attainable regions for particle size? We don't know. That remains an open question. But the question I ask is, can we reconfigure the Feinberg decomposition methodology and apply it to the attainable region of particle sizes to find out what these attainable regions look like for any and every conceivable crystallization process? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a wonderful area for research. These calculations were all carried out by Thomas Vetter, ably super, jointly supervised by Chris Bircham at Eli Lilly. So the conclusions are that we can do many things currently in the digital design of drug products and processes, but we cannot do everything. The key thing is what Sargent said 50 years ago. The problem is not so much one of numerical techniques. That is still true. It's one of basic understanding of the physical mechanisms involved. And here are the two key ones that I would like to identify. The first is mixing rules for force fields. We can parameterize force fields very well for pure substances, and that's been done for many different force fields, like the amber force field, the charm force field, and so forth. But then you have to mix those pure components in order to do a solubility calculation because you need the force field for the solute and the force field for the solvent or solvents. And so you have to mix those pure component force field parameters using mixing rules. And what we find time and time again is the traditional Berthelot-Lorenz mixing rules with no mixture-specific interaction parameters don't do very well. And in fact, in order to do adequately better, mixture-specific mixing rules need to be introduced. And that then is hardly a prediction. So I think that there's tremendous opportunity in further research of the fundamentals of force field mixing rules and secondary nucleation. All of these commercial crystallizers are nucleated not by homogeneous nucleation, but by attrition in a secondary nucleation mechanism. And that's a field that's just ripe for research. The last topic I want to talk about very briefly is water. Water is becoming more and more scarce, not only in the developed world, but all over the world. And I'd like to bring your attention to a huge project that's being led by Benny F Freeman at the University of Texas. And the overall purpose of this project is to produce water that is fit for purpose from water that is not. And in order to do this, Benny has assembled an incredibly impressive team of polymer chemists and polymer scientists who are ably led by Rachel Siegelman, my colleague, and they're developing new types of polymer membranes with complex microstructures that are capable of rejecting solutes, such as boron, that the current generation of membranes are not able to reject. This requires new types of transport models, since the traditional transport models don't apply to these complex microstructures. There's work going on on patterned membrane surfaces for specific kinds of separations. And there's a whole selection of projects on water chemistry, ably led by Lynn Katz, also at the University of Texas on fouling and anti-fouling membranes. And I'm expecting over the next decade or so that tremendous things will come out of this collaborative effort. So today, <clears throat> Industry continues to innovate and forge ahead to make products that society requires for a better standard of living. But I hope what I've demonstrated to you 
in all of the things that I've mentioned about chemical engineering science is the truth of Kurt Lewin's statement, famous statement, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. And for my final slide, I want to say a few things about teaching and service. After all, I work in a university, and the key thing that we do in a university is teach students. If you think you know a subject, try teaching it. One of the things I've learned over 45 years in the business is you can spend so much time putting a subject together so it's taught well that students can understand. And to my younger colleagues, the advice I would give you is try hard, do well, the students will really appreciate it. Of course, the departments we work in do not run themselves. They require an enormous amount of effort to run effectively from the department chair down through graduate and undergraduate admissions and all of the internal runnings of a department. Everybody should pitch in. Universities, the main thing we do, we're all here for the research. We all love to do the research, but the main thing we actually do is educate students. But we should also be making sure we educate the public and especially the government. And my final comment is to my academic friends, you should collaborate with industry. And to my industrial friends, you should collaborate with academics. My mantra is this, we in the university have clever students, but we need money and inspiration. You in industry have money and inspiration, but you need clever graduates. Surely there's a good proposition here for an excellent relationship. Finally, let me make a few acknowledgements. <clears throat> this is my wife now. And then, here she is enjoying a pint of Adnam's Ale, sitting on the banks of the River Cam in 1974. My daughter, Sarah, my son, Max, my parents. My supervisor, my PhD supervisor at Cambridge, John Perkins, he taught me everything I know about how to supervise students. At the time, we were both in our early 20s. Talk about sending boys to do men's work. I'd like to acknowledge my longtime collaborators, Mike Malone and Jim Douglas, and finally, my friends and sponsors of the Chair in Process Systems Engineering that I hold at UC Santa Barbara. And of course, none of this would have been possible without my 95 doctoral, postdoctoral, and master's students. I'm just the front man for all of you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. That's everything I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, although the audience can applaud, <laughs> we all appreciate your outstanding lecture and your great perspective on the chemical engineering frontier. Thank you. It's very silent here in the studio. <laughs> So uh, we now have time for questions from the audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question of Mike, please uh, enter that into the Q&A box. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, I'm going to take a sip of water while that's happening. Okay, our first question, Mike. Yep. How, how does this compare with current ideas of process intensification? All related. It's all the same thing. The, the uh, methodology that I talked about, the Feinberg decomposition, what you will essentially always discover from that is that the, uh, the process is highly intensified, combining reactions, separations, uh, energy, mass transfer, and so forth. The, the, uh, I think the Feinberg decomposition is exactly the right thing we need to benchmark in that 
int uh, process integration domain. And let me say this, if you work in industry and you've developed a kinetic model, you owe it to yourself and your management to calculate the Feinberg selectivity limit so that you can allocate resources to decide what is the most important thing to work on next. Is it the kinetics and the catalysis, or is it more creative process engineering? Thank you. Okay, the next question is about teaching. My impression is that it is important that the young professionals know their limits. Have you a comment on this? Well, it's important. We all know our limits. <laughs> the, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what the question uh, refers to, but let me say that, um, in my opinion, research is really important, but teaching is also extremely important. And I've been criticized by my colleagues my entire career for spending too much time on teaching, but it's something I love to do, and I think the students in my courses have uh, benefited from, from that and have enjoyed the lectures. A good movie, a good book, a good painting or work of art should make you think about it for the, for the hours and days after the event. And a good lecture should do the same thing. Next question, could you elaborate more on the Feinberg selectivity low versus high and focus on the catalyst or process? So if the, if the Feinberg selectivity happens to turn out to be very high, let's say 95% or higher, by the way, the example I showed you is atypical. The Feinberg selectivity limit is rarely 100%. It just so happens for that particular example, it was. But we've calculated many, many other, uh, much more complex examples where the Feinberg selectivity limit is not 100%. So if the Feinberg selectivity limit is high, then, and your, your process is giving you a much lower one, what that's telling you is there's potentially room to move by developing a more creative process. And sometimes the Feinberg limit will give you strong hints about what to do. For example, in, in one case that we studied, the Feinberg selectivity limit or the, the methodology told us that the limiting reactant that we had assumed in the process calculations was actually the wrong reactant and that we should switch the two components and change the limiting reactant to the one that we hadn't picked. So sometimes you can get very strong hints from what the Feinberg limit is telling you on how you might reconfigure your process. Thank you. Next question. How might you see data science or machine learning fit in the future of process optimization? I have no comment on that. You can ask my colleague, Jim Rawlings, to answer that one. Okay. What other subfields in chemical engineering are in need of their own Carnot efficiency Feinberg decomposition? Oh, good question. Um, <clears throat> wow, that is a good question. I'm sure that in the bio area, I, I, you'll notice I didn't say anything about biotechnology. As much as I admire the subject, I know so little about it that I thought it was dangerous to even mention it. But I dare say <clears throat> there are wonderful potential applications of these benchmarks that can be done for metabolic pathways. I mean, imagine you have some complex metabolic pathway that has a certain uh, efficiency of converting sugars into energy. <clears throat> what would be the for a given pathway and a given set of kinetics, what would be the Feinberg limit uh, that could be achieved? I, I don't think anybody is thinking about that. Well, maybe Marty is, <clears throat> but um, again, that, that's a, that would be a wonderful area for research. Next question. What would be your suggestion or your word of advice to young graduate students who are just starting the PhD program? Live the dream. Um, 
I get up every morning and have done for nearly 50 years, and all I want to do is go to work. Crazy as it sounds, I'm nearly 70 years old. All I do every day is get out of bed and want to go to work. Find, find something you're passionate about, and you will have a wonderful life. You will not be bored, and you will make useful, constructive uh, <coughs> um, contributions to society. Find something you love to do. Be passionate about it. It's wonderful. Where do you see the chemical engineering discipline going into the future? I think <clears throat> key areas of, of course, biotechnology is one. Key areas, I think, are uh, sustainable energy, Without energy, our society grinds to a halt. And the rate at which we are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is obviously totally unsustainable. I know that there are one or two people who don't believe this, but they'll be out of office soon. And um, we can get back to work on developing better chemistries, better products, better processes that require much less CO2 uh, contamination of the atmosphere. And uh, one of the areas that I see that has tremendous opportunity is hydrogen. The hydrogen economy has sputtered along for many years now, but I predict uh, before the end of my life, if I'm lucky, the hydrogen economy will pick up, that hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles will, will become uh, much more common. I personally believe in the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle over the battery electric vehicle. The idea of lugging around 500 pounds of battery materials to produce the energy to run your engine to me is ludicrous. What battery, what battery vehicles mean is mining, more mining. And that is not a good thing. So I, I am, I'm a strong believer in hydrogen and the possibilities for hydrogen. And I think those are some of the areas that I, I think the future is bright for research. We appreciate that perspective. Next question. Of the challenges you described in crystal product prediction, which challenge, if any, is the most daunting and requires fundamentally new ideas? Uh, nucleation. Not, okay. And I don't mean classical nucleation. Classical nucleation is under control. Everyone says that classical nucleation theory disagrees with experiment by order, orders of magnitude. That's wrong. That's a lie. Um, <clears throat> classical nucleation theory, if you take into account the very important effect that the surface energy below about 10, 10 nanometers in size, which of course all the nuclei are, the surface energy is a strong function of size of particle. If you take that into account, say using the Tolman methodology, you get extremely good agreement between classical nucleation theory and experiment. So classical nucleation theory is not the issue. The models are good and moreover, it doesn't really happen in most uh, production processes. I think nucleation is, to me, that I, I've no idea where, where to start on that problem. And I think that is really a, a huge and very important problem to develop good models for secondary nucleation. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, next question. Has there been any work thinking about these types of kinetic limits? in terms of their impact on the evolution of biological systems, that is animal digestive systems, extracting nutrients from food. No. Nope. In other words, has biology evolved optimal biochemical processes? No, nope. the answer is no. And I am absolutely confident that that area is ripe for application of the Feinberg decomposition. And I strongly encourage people working in biotechnology to take up that uh, aspect of research. I think you will discover a lot of interesting things. Okay. Two more questions. How do you see cell factories, micro production of desirable chemicals, 
fitting in with these advances? No idea. Okay. Last question. The gap between university and business, how has it evolved from your perspective? What are your thoughts on creating improved connections? You have to try hard. You, you have to get out of the monastery. I'm talking to my academic friends now. You have to get out of the monastery and meet people. You have to get involved in consulting. You have to work on problems that uh, industry wants to know the answers to. Sometimes they don't know that they need to know the answers to those problems, and therefore you have to work really hard to persuade them that they do. But industry will listen. If you develop methods that really improve the understanding and the conceptual design of processes, industry will listen. So uh, it takes hard work, and there's no substitute for, for making those connections. Go to conferences and, and make connections to industrial people in the audience, and you just have to be persistent. And similarly to my industrial friends, <clears throat> You also have to work hard. You, you have to find people and departments and universities where you really want to invest and make a long-term commitment. The thing that we do well in a university is research that takes 10 years, not 10 weeks or 10 months. And it takes commitment from industry. If, you, if you're going to work on a problem like the Feinberg decomposition, you. you you should have been supporting Marty Feinberg for a decade. I'm sure nobody did, by the way, other than the NSF. But uh, you, you have to find a problem and stick with it and believe that your champions will actually come through. I think the, a big mistake is to think that the university is a cheap way of doing short-term problems. That is a complete waste of time for universities and for the PhD students. What we do well are projects that take five years or 10 years to complete. So true. So um, I wanna thank everyone for your questions and thank you again, Mike, and congratulations to you for presenting the Institute Lecture for this year. Thank you for inviting me and it was a pleasure to give it. Thank you, Jennifer.